Hello. Welcome to Seeing Virginia History Through Colonial Portraits. I'm Karen Wolf. I am the Executive Director of the Omohundro Institute, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you to what will be, I think, a very rewarding presentation today. And I want to thank all of you so much for being with us. Although we are not in the Omohundro offices on the campus at William & Mary, we nonetheless always want to offer, and even our, in our virtual events, the land acknowledgement that William & Mary's President Catherine Rowe recently approved. William & Mary acknowledges the indigenous peoples who are the original inhabitants of the lands our campus is on today, the Cherowinahaka, Chickahominy, Eastern Chickahominy, Mattaponi, Monacan, Nansamon, Nottaway, Pamunkey, Potawomac, Upper Mattaponi, and Rappahannock tribes, and pay our respect to tribal members past and present. A few notes now about our program today. We're using a new platform, which we think is going to provide a slightly better sound and video quality than Zoom, which we typically use for webinars, but there may be a few technical delays, so I hope you'll bear with us. We've practiced with this, we're confident about it, but just wanna warn you. If you have questions about the program, please post them in the YouTube chat. To do that, you'll need to have a YouTube channel, but you should have instructions for that from Martha Howard, and you should also see those to the right of the presentation. If you have any questions about the OI program schedule, please email us or visit the events page at oievents.wm.edu. An exciting feature of today's program is that you can visit the website and explore the research on which Janine Bolt's uh, work is based at colonialvirginiaportraits.org. This work is made possible through the support of the Lapidus Initiative at the OI. Now, it's a pleasure to introduce our speakers, and then I'm going to step off this virtual stage. First up this, this afternoon is Janine Yoramoto bolt Janine has a PhD from William & Mary in the American Studies program. She is currently Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Postdoctoral Curatorial Fellow at the American Philosophical Society. She is the author and the researcher behind Colonial Virginia Portraits, published by the Omohundro Institute in 2019, the website I just told you about, and she is currently working on a book, The Politics of Portraiture in Colonial Virginia. Bill Rasmussen has a PhD from the University of Delaware. He is senior curator and Laura M. Robbins Curator of Art at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. He is the co-author of 10 books, most recently, The Story of Virginia, Highlights from the Virginia Museum of History and Culture with Jamie Boskett. Karen Sherry also has her PhD from the University of Delaware. She is a curator for the Virginia Museum of History and Culture and her most recent exhibit, Agents of Change, Female Activism in Virginia from Women's Suffrage to Today was hosted from March to November of 2020. Okay, I'm gonna step off now and hand the baton or the microphone or whatever our virtual equivalent is over to Janine. All right, thanks so much everybody for joining us today. I just wanna say that I'm so glad to be part of this event and to be able to join Bill and Karen today uh, because the Virginia Museum of History and Culture supported this dissertation research with the research fellowship several years ago and has supported the Colonial Virginia Portraits Project by generously sharing all of the images in their collection um, that are now available on the site. The Virginia Museum is also the largest repository for colonial Virginia portraits. And so I'm really glad that we're able to partner tonight and to share some highlights from the collection. And I also wanna take a brief moment to thank all of the other museums, institutions, archives, and private owners who have generously shared images from their collections on colonial Virginia portraits. Now I'm gonna pull up my slides. Today, I'm mostly uh, going to provide an overview of colonialvirginiaportraits.org. Um, the database began as a personal reference database while I was researching and writing my dissertation on the topic. I wanted to write a dissertation about how colonists used portraits and how distinctive regional practices emerged over time to better understand the transformation of Virginia society. I strongly suspected that portraiture functioned differently in Virginia than in other regions. For one thing, the plantation setting for the majority of these portraits and their creation was vastly different than the urban townhouses of Boston and Philadelphia, areas that have received more attention from art historians. Virginia was also a slave society. And while slavery certainly existed in other colonies, 
And far more research needs to be done about slavery and its relationship to art and material culture in urban areas. The fact remains that plantation slavery revolving around tobacco production was pretty unique in Virginia. The specifics of tobacco agriculture shaped Virginia plantation slavery and led to planters living most of their uh, lives and most of their times at their plantation homes and maintaining close oversight over enslaved labor. This means that apart from living on site, these wealthy Virginia planters also had large numbers of enslaved domestic laborers who were within their homes. Enslaved people were therefore incidental audiences for all of these colonial portraits in Virginia plantation homes. And the specific race relations that developed in Virginia affected how people wanted to be represented in their portraits. I was also very interested in portraits created before about 1740, which is roughly the date that historians assign to the beginning of the consumer revolution in the British colonies. This is when the consumption and importation of English goods rose dramatically. Historians often consider portraits primarily as a type of commodity showing off a subject's wealth, status, and Englishness. And many of the major publications about po colonial portraiture begin studies in the 1740s. But there's a longer tradition of portraiture in Virginia. And what you see on screen now are just three early Virginia portraits. And in these three portraits alone, we see three very different visions of what it meant to be a colonial Virginian. On the left, we have Daniel Park, a Virginia planter who served in the War of Spanish Succession and eventually became a royal governor of the Leeward Islands. His portrait, painted in England, and I believe Bill is going to talk slightly more about this portrait, celebrates his role within the larger British Empire. His daughter Lucy, next to him, also a personal favorite portrait of mine, happened to be painted in England on her only documented trip there. Her portrait includes an enslaved attendant, one of only three enslaved attendants included in colonial Virginia portraiture. It also includes a basket likely made by an indigenous woman from the Southeast and a silver embroidered red fabric from the global textile trade. She's turned the basket into her sewing basket and a very fine piece of white linen peeks out of it. The portrait thus speaks to Virginians participation in both regional and global imperial trade. Her husband, William Byrd II, was a Virginia Indian trader, a slave trader, a tobacco planter, and a colonial official. The portrait also pictures the planter's idealized racial hierarchy showing a white woman in command of a submissive non-white enslaved youth, thus participating in a construction of a social relationship on the plantation. Lucy also stands very assertively in her portrait, countering the popular idea that colonial women were often painted as passive subjects. And on the right is George Eskridge, a much simpler portrait, but likely painted in Virginia by a now unknown artist. The portrait reveals the aspirations of local Virginia artists and subjects to participate in British portrait practices to the best of their ability. These three portraits are just three of the many that have generally been overlooked in standard narratives of early American art history. So during my research, I began collecting information on as many portraits as I could, including collecting information on portraits that no longer survive, like that of John Robinson, now known only through his nephew's probate inventory. A lot of the information was collected systematically. I scoured records of the MESDA Object Database, the Frick Art Reference Library, and the Smithsonian Catalog of American Portraits. I also looked at object files and the collection files at institutions like the Virginia Museum of History and Culture and Colonial Williamsburg. And I was in touch with some smaller historic sites and collections like Shirley Plantation, which boasts an intact family portrait collection dating back to the 1680s. I also used online resources like the Gunston Hall Probate Inventory Database to look for references to portraits in wills and inventories. Other references I came across completely by chance, right? While researching particular people or places, 
I found references to family portraits in published genealogies and in archival documents. Having collected information for over 500 portraits from a span of about 150 years allowed me to make arguments about who was painted and why, what they looked like and why, and how these portraits and practices changed over time. I could consider how portraiture as a social practice in Virginia changed between Henry Fitzhugh's 1634 London portrait, which was brought to Virginia by his son, and Henry Taswell's 1775 portrait, which was painted in Williamsburg on the eve of the American Revolution. I'm able to make arguments uh, based on case studies of all these individual portraits and family collections, combined with an understanding of much broader trends. So that's the story uh, that my dissertation tries to tell, and now that, that's my book project. And then the Omohundro Institute offered to partner with me to make this database an open access digital project to share all of this research. And that's how the website came to be. So now you at home can also browse these portraits and you can browse them by family name, location, artist, decade, and attributes. Colonial Virginia portraits visually reunites family collections including the extensive bird family collection from Westover Plantation. And being able to connect these portraits by family names and historic locations is important uh, for reasons that Bill's gonna talk more about when he discusses family collections and dynastic functions of portraiture in Virginia. Wherever possible, the entry for every individual portrait includes, of course, a picture, subject's name, date or likely date of creation, brief biographical information, a description of the portrait, any references to the portrait from archival documents, and the current location of the portrait. I also included any major published references to the portrait and citations for information included. Plus, in the descriptions and biographies, any other related portrait that is mentioned and that appears in the database is linked. If a name or phrase links to another portrait, the font appears in dark red. So this page has two linked portraits and one of them is Henry Fitzhugh's wife, Sarah. So if you click on Sarah, it will then take you to her portrait entry. Each entry also includes the attributed artist and the likely decade or decades when the portrait was painted. And I chose to include decades because it's often very difficult to precisely date a portrait. So these Fitzhugh portraits are an exception because there's a surviving receipt in the family papers. But I wanted people to be able to explore portraits created around similar time period to explore trends. The family names associated with the subjects are also included for each entry. And if the subject was a married woman, then both her maiden and married surnames are included to start gesturing towards these larger kinship networks. 18th century locations associated with the portrait are also listed, and these could be their cities, towns, or individual plantation homes where the portrait was hung and or displayed. The artist of Sarah Fitzhugh's portrait, John Hesalius, probably painted the subject at her home, Bedford Plantation, where the portrait also hung. But in other examples, portraits moved to other locations during the 18th century, in which case multiple locations are listed. There are also multiple locations if a portrait was painted in a city and then displayed in a subject's home at a different location. Portrait attributes are also listed, and these attributes are features of the portrait, including the gender of the subject, any props, costume information, size of the canvas, etc. So each of these are tags that allow you to click on them and see every other portrait in the database with that tagged information. The browse by attribute feature can be useful for researchers. If you're interested in understanding, for instance, how women were represented, uh, you can browse through all of the known portraits of colonial Virginia women. And I believe Karen's gonna talk more about how to read and interpret a few individual portraits as evidence. But being able to see all of these related images can be a useful first step for interpreting trends and representations. There's not another visual archive quite like this one for colonial portraiture. 
Colonial Virginia Portraits allows for interactivity and it helps the users connect portraits and sitters and brings together works by different artists and from different locations and collections. Further, because it is digital, I can continue to update the database as new evidence comes to light. The digital format also makes visual comparisons and relationships much easier to spot as well as to see changes over time. And so with that brief overview of the database, I will turn things over to uh, Bill, who's going to talk a little bit more about how the Virginia Museum acquired so many portraits. Well, I'm going to try to figure out how to get my images on the screen. So. Well, I can. I think we can get them larger than that, but well, I'll just I'll just go with it the way it is then. Um, I, I want to give you an, a brief overview of the collection by focusing on um, its 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 strength, and its strength is it lies in the groups of portraits that we have. But I want to start first with um, two quotes of the period that that help explain uh, the argument I'm making because these early paintings that we own give one message loud and clear. Uh, and that was that there were pressing social needs in the colony that portraiture helped to answer. The society then was competitive, it was unstable economically, and uh, the, the newly forming gentry members did not feel comfortable with their status and portraits could help by celebrating that status, defining it, preserving it. And this man, William Fitzhugh, of Northern Virginia, an image of him done in 1697. This is a later copy of it. And he is 46 years old. He's in Northern Virginia where there's nothing there. Uh, and he wrote, he said, he said, one needs to present a creditable appearance in order to live comfortably in Virginia. And he certainly presented a creditable appearance here. He looks like he's walked in, in off the streets of, of London. Um, and, and now I'm going to go to the, to the next slide, but I'm not, um, sure I'm going to do that. Maybe I can do it this way. I, I can do it probably this way. There, I got it now. Um, this is a portrait of Isham Randolph. That's 1724, probably done in England. Um, and there's a wonderful story that's a, a well-known story involving him. He had a great garden in his plantation just up the James River west of Richmond. And he was going to be visited by a man in Philadelphia, John Bartram, a botanist. And they had a mutual friend, Peter Collinson, uh, a merchant in London. And he, he warned um, Bartram, if you're going to Virginia, you better go clean, neat, and handsomely dressed because people there look more at a man's outside than his inside. Um, and there's some truth to that still today. The, uh, the strength, as I said, of the, of the collection is, is tied to its holdings of groups. Most of them are family groups, but there's one great group of, of portraits that Janine mentioned uh, that William Byrd II of Westover put together. And, um, and that certainly is a highlight of our collection because it it, it, the whole collection consisted of 30 paintings and we have one third of those. We have 10 of those in, in, in our collection. Uh, Bird was a, a remarkable person. He had a library of 4,000 books um, and he, he built the, 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 one of the greatest pieces of architecture in colonial America, the Westover Plantation that Janine showed you. And this, in terms of this, his collection of portraits, 30 of them, was by far the best collection in all of colonial America in terms of both quantity and quality. Uh, this is a portrait of Bird uh, done in England, attributed to Hans Heising, a British uh, painter. And he's age 50 here. Um, he was sent to England at age seven. He had a hard time there, but he did rather well. And he spent 12 years, 1714 to 1726, in which he collected almost all of those 30 
portraits. He was called a provincial there, and he admitted in one of his writings that he was sorely sensible of injuries because he was looked upon as an outsider. After his first wife um, died, he was courting others, and the father of one of them said, your plantation in Virginia might as well be on the moon. It's, it's worthless. And the Heising is sensitive to his to the fact that Byrne was caught between two worlds, I put in, and so he put the ship in the background, uh, making that point. And Janine it sh showed you the picture of his first wife, Lucy, um, Lucy Park Byrne, who was uh, who, who was presented as a woman who was used to get in her way, and, and and the image suggests she would not like to be the person with whom she disagrees. And, and Janine also showed you the portrait of her father, um, Daniel Park II, uh, attributed to John Klosterman, another English artist. It's, it's got to be one of the most spectacular paintings to hang in an early American collection. And his, his, uh, his story, pretty much of his story, at least the good parts of it, are told in, this, uh, in the background of the, ba uh, the canons of Blenheim, the Battle of Blenheim, that was the victory that Marlborough uh, achieved against the armies of Louis XIV in the War of Spanish Succession. And um, Park was, was chosen to send the message back to Queen Anne. And on the way in the, in the bottom left, you see the medals, the, the gold medals given to him by Dutch and the Dutch and other allies. And Queen Anne gave him a miniature of herself that he's wearing around his neck. Um, so the story is told out there. He wanted to be the governor, appointed the governor of Virginia. He didn't get that. He was appointed the governor of the Leeward Islands, and he behaved so uh, uh, atrociously there by um, debauching the, a number of wives and daughters of the settlers that he was murdered in plain daylight on the steps of the courthouse in Antigua. So quite a story to that one. I've jumped too far ahead. I want to show you two of his of his friends that, that, that you know, the spectacular portraits, and they say a lot about how, how Byrd succeeded in, in England. He, he was an outsider, as were people from Scotland and Ireland. So here's the one from Scotland, John Campbell, the second Duke of Argyle, uh, painted by William Aikman, and a stunning portrait of this man who also fought under the Duke of Marlborough and uh, had a, played an important role in the Union of Scotland and England uh, in, in 1707. Um, he, he, he's awarded the, 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 the Order of the Garter, the star that you see there on his, on his coat, uh, the, the Britain's most elite order of knighthood. So he was, he was uh, very successful, but yet he was still considered something of an outsider. And the other one I wanted to show you is the outsider from Ireland. Um, and um, this is Charles Boyle, the fourth Earl of Orrery, a member of the Irish Parliament, a gifted man. Uh, it, you can see this portrait needs conservation. Um, so I, I should make a pitch for that, but um, it, 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 I think it can be conserved and can be quite striking. Uh, this man achieved a number of things. He translated some of Plutarch's works. And he was the patron behind the first mechanical solar system model where you could walk around. There's one of, there's one of these from the 19th century at Washington and Lee University. You can actually see how they work. And he was a sponsor for it, and so it's, it was named for him. It's still known as an orrery. It's a model of, of, the, of the solar system, and it, it moves. So it's, it was, it was, uh, it's, it's a very interesting history to that and to his involvement in it. Now, the, I'm, I'll show you two of the family groups. Um, the, the, the Randolph family group is really quite extraordinary because there are 15 paintings of them. Most of them um, were, not this one, but most of the 15 were commissioned by William Randolph III of Wilton Plantation, which was down river in Charles City County and 100 years ago was moved to Richmond, where, where Wilton is now. And, and most of these paintings uh, were were hung in that house uh, and made quite a statement about the the, the Randolph dynasty. Um, he uh, this is William Randolph the first about 1670 by an English unidentified English artist with that with that um, the towering uh, wig and the Steinkirk 
cravat and the tailored coat. He's an impressive looking um, figure. And the Randolphs were, were really remarkable in that they established so many uh, plantations. His heirs established 11 plantations that uh, accumulated tens of thousands of acres of land, hundreds of slaves. They were their own merchants and ship owners. And in Moby Dick, Herman Melville has the line that says, if you were a Randolph of Virginia, you wouldn't have to go to sea like the unfortunate people that did have to go to sea. Um, there's been confusion in the family about who is who in all these 15 portraits, but it's pretty clear, I think, that this is his wife, Mary Isham Randolph, and this is a pretty bad copy of a lost painting of her. Uh, she's in, a, in, a, in the costume of um, the era of Sir Peter Lely, but um, the, co the, um, the copy doesn't, doesn't, doesn't achieve the excellence that the English models uh, do. Here is the portrait of William, his, their son, William Randolph II. It's signed on the back by John Wallace, and he said it's a copy. So it's not in the 1750s. It looks a little tentative in the face because it is a copy. And this, although it's been, I think, mispublished a number of times as Mary Isham Randolph, is actually Mrs. Randolph II because she's wearing a costume that did not exist at the time of Mrs. William Randolph I. And then here's the patron, William Randolph III of, 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 of Wilton and his wife. These were commissioned and painted in the 1750s by John Wollaston. And he painted several of their children. I'll show you one of them. And mercifully, he turned the two of these portraits on their side to give a little variety. And it gives us this wonderful image of Elizabeth Randolph at age five or six with a doll. It's a fashion doll that was used to show the latest fashions to the provincials like those in the colonies, but it worked quite well as a child's doll. And, and, the, and she had younger brothers and sisters who were too young at this point to be painted. But 18 years later, Matthew Pratt came by, passed through Virginia. And so he was commissioned to paint uh, two of them when, uh, of course, they're old by that point, 18 years later. And this is Lucy Randolph Burwell in a painting um, it's a, it's a, it's a, 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 an American version of the English conversation piece, where in England you'd have a manicured back lawn, garden in the background. Of course, in Virginia, you have the wilderness instead. Instead, and Matthew Pratt would use uh, elements of the, of his paintings again and again, because no one would be able to put them side by side like we're doing. So you look at our fashionable headdress, which came straight out of Italy at the time. And in another painting, our collection, um, Mary Jemima Balfour, uh, the same headdress appears. And in the background is curtains and a, and a pole that appear in, in one of the, in the portrait of Lucy uh, Randolph Pearl's brother's image, as well as Mary Jemima Balfour's husband's image. So these artists would use a lot of props. So it's interesting. We can see this today with, uh, with the means we have. So I'm back to William Fitzhugh, who I started with at the beginning. Here he is at age 46 and, and, and a painting and an image that was painted first in 1697. And John Asalius made this copy and wrote on the back of it to tell us how old he was and that he was making a copy of this lost original. And this is the one, the creditable appearance that I, I pointed, pointed to before. He acquired uh, also, to show his creditability, he acquired 55,000 acres, and he had a, an extraordinary collection of English silver that no one else in America could match, 122 pieces of it, which he said this collection was both politic and reputable, uh, which he meant that he could melt it down if he needed to. And then he left us his, his journal, which is in the, our collection of manuscripts, our, our collection of 9 million manuscripts. This is a particularly valuable letter book in which he writes, and he says, he lived comfortably and handsomely and entertained, entertained visitors with good wine, three fiddlers, a jester, a typewriter dancer, and an acrobat who tumbled around. And he finished his house with tapestries, and he wrote, he never courted unlawful pleasures with women, unlike William Byrd or, or Daniel Park, and he avoided hard drinking as much as lay in my power. Um, and so he starts the dynasty, and our collection has shows five generations of it. And and the, all of these paintings were done um, by John Hesalius, who we could 
described describe as a court painter to the Fitzhugh dynasty. Um, so the first portrait is this man's father, which you see here, who is Henry Fitzhugh. Um, he died in 1664. He lived in he was a, he lived in in Bedford, England. He was a wool merchant, and his image was brought to America by his son. And then this the William Fitzhugh's son, an old man at this point, was Henry Fitzhugh. I'll come back for a minute. Um, they tended to name everyone Henry, so he's referred to as Captain Henry Fitzhugh done in about 1751 by John Asalius. It's interesting that we have in our collection another portrait of this man that's almost identical to it. It proves the point that there were different branches, there were different lines of the same dynasty. They all wanted, and these different lines wanted to, to have a portrait collection as well uh, to, to show the dynasty, to show their importance. And um, some of the paintings survived and some didn't. And so his son, is the is the person who, who commissioned John Asagas to paint all of these in in the 1750s and is Henry Fitzhugh of course is his name we he's referred to as Colonel Henry Fitzhugh and uh, Janine showed you this portrait and his wife of uh, Sarah Battelle Fitzhugh and then two decades later their children grow up and their son is Henry Fitzhugh of course Henry again referred to as Henry Fitzhugh of Fitzhugh And obviously he's grown up and Salus has grown up as a painter. He's learned a lot uh, of how to paint from the work of John Wollaston. It's more three dimensional. It's got more modeling. It's got more sophisticated coloring and the shading. The fabric's extraordinary. As you can see, particularly in the portrait of his wife, Elizabeth Stith Fitzhugh, 1771, uh, 17 years old in this portrait. Um, and it's a stunning image. I wanted to mention the fact that we have several groups of, chil of uh, children's portraits or several extraordinary children's portraits. This is the Grimes children. Um, and this, this one, uh, these are the children of um, Philip and Mary Grimes of Brandon in Middlesex County, done about 1750. They range in age from seven to two um, and they are being modeled to, uh, to, to become members of the gentry. They dress like it, they act like it. And um, it's fascinating to compare these, this image, their portraits of English, of children in England who look just like this. And I even found one once that had a, a wagon that was identical to the wagon that you see here. So the goal was to, to, to emulate a society in England and sometimes they came pretty close to it. And then I'm gonna just start you with this portrait and Karen's gonna talk more about it. And we both are drawn to it because it's the best portrait in the collection. Uh, in our collection, Robert Carter III, um, done in 1753 by um, Thomas Hudson, who was the best portraitist, best portraitist in England at the time. This is before uh, Reynolds and Gainsborough come on the stage. And in our collection of the manu of manuscripts, of our nine million manuscripts, we have is a, a, a receipt, his account that he paid 30 pounds to to. Um, to Hudson for this canvas, and he got a pretty good buy considering the quality of it. Um, he's, he's, he's off to a masquerade party dressed in the style of 100 years earlier, the equivalent if we were going to a Roaring Twenties party and dressing in the era, in the costume of that era. And of course, he's got a mask. And then, of course, his face is a mask because his cousin, John Page, the future gentleman said that he wasn't such a virtuous person as that face suggests. He said, Page said, uh, London left him inconceivably illiterate and also corrupted and vicious. Um, so I will stop at this point and, um, and turn it over to Karen. All right. Well, thank you. Um, following Janine, who um, introduced us to this wonderful database, uh, this resource, and um, showcased how it can demonstrate certain art historical uh, developments, um, changes, as well as points of continuity. And, and Bill um, showed us a bit of, about highlights of the Virginia Museum of History's collection and the dynastic aspirations that these family groups of portraits 
demonstrate. I'm going to talk a bit about the function and meaning of portraiture in colonial Virginia in my section of today's presentation. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what do portraits tell us about the people pictured. I'm going to pull up my slides. Um, now, um, in, in a very general way, of course, uh, portrait functions to record a general likeness of the person, uh, as well as to convey information about the sitter's identity. So you can think about portraits as functioning like a visual sign. Um, it's, it's an image that's coded with meanings that were legible or comprehensible to uh, contemporary audiences. Um, so today I'm going to use some examples of portraits in the VMHC's collection to um, read uh, some of these signs and, and visual cues to see what they can tell us about the sitters depicted. Um, I'm picking up where Bill left off with this absolutely gorgeous portrait of Robert Carter III. It was painted during his, his wayward youth in London, which is um, Bill showed us uh, uh, by reading some quotes of um, Robert Carter's contemporaries, left him somewhat vicious um, because he basically abandoned his legal studies to become a party boy in London. Um, he, he changed later in life, he matured, uh, but uh, during his youth, he was a bit of a dandy and enjoyed um, uh, various vices offered by London society. So when we encounter a portrait of a colonial sitter, it tells us first and foremost that this sitter came from wealth. Um, it was really just the wealthy elite people who could afford to commission portraits. Um, so uh, because of the expense of having a painting made of you or a family member, that immediately tells us that this person is from a wealthy family. Um, and that wealth is not only communicated by the material fact of the portrait, but it is also signified by the stuff depicted within the portrait, the um, material finery of the clothing, the fancy furniture, the um, uh, luxurious draperies and other attributes. A portrait on a very basic level also indicates that this person has a certain social status, um, whether real or aspirational a status that comes not just from their wealth, but also from their position in Virginia society. Um, and um, let me see a little bit of that. Um, okay, I'm not able to advance my slides. Um, Sorry, these are one of the <laughs> aforementioned technical glitches that we said we might have. Um, let's see if I can do it now. There we go. Uh, so um, the um, status of the sitter is communicated in part by the fact that Virginia portraits, as Bill mentioned, generally emulate the grand style of British and European portraiture that was used to depict royals, nobility, and other social elites. And these are grand manor traditions that were established in the 17th century by um, court painters such as Sir Anthony Van Dyke, uh, as well as um, in the 18th century by Sir Godfrey Neller, Thomas Hudson, Sir Joshua Reynolds, and others. So artists who were painting Virginians generally followed these, these traditions in part to impart the status of um, European gentry onto their Virginia counterparts. Now portraits also contain more personalized, uh, individualized information about the sitter using a range of visual clues and attributes. And we see that here in Robert Carter III's portrait with the detail of the mask that he is holding. Um, as Bill mentioned, um, 
he is dressed to attend a masquerade ball, one of the many social pursuits that he enjoyed during his studies in London. And um, not only does his costume speak to his participation in a masquerade, but so does the mask that he's holding. So this is a clue to uh, his, his active social life in London, his enjoyment of masquerade balls and other elements of London's lively social scene. Um, also, I think uh, in a sort of um, uh, more abstract way, um, the mask is a reminder to us that a portrait is really a performance in art. A portrait is a painted construction of the sitter's identity. And I think it's really important to keep that in mind. We can't just take portraits at their literal face value. We can't assume that they're um, um, accurate, realistic documentations of, uh, of a person, of a fact, but rather they are constructions that reflect the choices of self-presentation made through the collaboration of the artist and the sitter. It's that pair, the artist and the sitter, uh, who decide what information to convey about the sitter's identity in the portrait. And um, this construction is made through the careful selection of attributes, including pose and gesture, clothing, settings, and other props um, and things that appear within the portrait. And in thinking about a portrait like a painted construction, you might wanna think yourself about how you pose for your selfies that you post onto your social media, what filters you use and so forth. You might wanna think about how you set up your uh, Zoom displays, what's in the background behind you, what, what does that kind of setting convey about you um, and what you want to project as your identity to your audiences? Colonial portraitures functioned in a similar way. Now, um, I wanna look at a few um, attributes that commonly appear in Virginia portraits and dissect a little bit about what they mean, what these visual clues signify. Um, and if you look at a group of male portraits uh, from across the colonial period, you will come across the hand tuck, um, the pose of a gentleman standing with his hand tucked into um, uh, his waistcoat. Um, that's such a common attribute that uh, you might be left wondering, like, why, why, why is that? Why, why is that such a common gesture, a common pose? Well, it is such because it was prescribed in British and European portraiture traditions as being the proper pose for a well-mannered, genteel gentleman to adopt. And we see that um, that etiquette being communicated in such books as uh, the 18th century book, um, The Rudiments of Genteel Behavior, which um, includes a plate um, uh, instructing the reader how a gentleman gets posed. There's also descriptive text which reads, the arms must fall easy, not close to the sides, and the bend of the elbow at its due distance will permit the right hand to place itself in the waistcoat, easy and genteel. Um, so these were the kinds of um, manners that Virginia portrait sitters adopted to communicate their own gentility, their familiarity with these codes of high society proper behavior. Um, in addition to pose and gesture, you'll often see other attributes that tell us a bit about the identity of the sitter. Um, the portrait on the left, it has been in the past identified as William Byrd III, um, another young man who ran into some trouble in London. He developed a love for gambling and uh, gambled away much of his inheritance. And for a long time, we thought this portrait would depicted him uh, and the horse in the background would make sense um, because um, uh, William Byrd III loved to gamble on horses. But we're not sure if this still indeed represents William Byrd. Uh, the portrait on the right um, uh, by Robert Fulton, um, uh, the inventor of the steamship and other things, he was also an artist, 
Um, this is a portrait of William Prentice, which is more securely identified. And if you look at some of the details, you'll see that Prentice is holding a newspaper. Um, we can read the details. Uh, the title, this is the Virginia Gazette and Petersburg Intelligencer. And this combined with the bookshelf in the background tells us that this is a, um, is a man who is well read and is involved um, in news. And indeed, um, if you look at William Prentice's biography, you'll learn that he, um, in addition to being Petersburg's mayor, he was a printer, editor, and publisher. So it makes sense that he's holding a newspaper as a document of his trade. Now we um, also see pendant portraits of, of families, um, a paired portrait of a husband and wife, um, in this case of the Belfour family. Um, uh, it also includes their young son, George. James Balfour, he was a merchant and justice of the peace. He um, sits at a desk that is covered with um, uh, his business paperwork, books, other papers. He's also holding a letter as a sign of his business as a merchant. Um, and this is really a charming portrait. It appears as if he's just interrupted um, from his uh, daily business by his young son who comes into the room um, uh, playing a drum. So there's this wonderful contrast between the uh, serious um, uh, pursuits of the father and the playfulness of the child. Um, Mary's portrait um, similarly conveys some information about her uh, identity first and foremost that um, she's uh, very wealthy and fashionable. Um, she wears this elaborate costume. She's just draped in voluminous folds of, of fine satins and other fabrics. Um, Bill showed this portrait earlier and, and talked about uh, how she wears the, the latest headdress, um, this ribbon and a string of pearls that's woven into her elaborate um, bun. Um, what's really fascinating about this portrait uh, and particularly her dress, is this was a studio costume. Basically, the artist had this dress as part of the props he would provide to his sitters in his studio. So women could choose to be clad in the latest fashions out of London or Paris um, uh, for their portraits sitting with the artist. You'll notice that Mary also holds an open book in her lap. Um, that's a sign that uh, she was um, a well-educated lady, that she was literate. Other female portraits um, often contain attributes that speak to the woman's, not only her wealth and her social status, but also her beauty, her charm, and her gentility. And um, we, we see that in these two examples, one very grand portrait of Elizabeth Stythe Fitzhugh on the left, um, which shows her in this uh, elaborate and very fussy gown with layers and layers of lace and ruffles. And she's bedecked with all kinds of jewelry and her hair around her neck. She's also holding a string of pearls in her lap um, uh, as a testament to um, the wealth of her family and also her association um, with um, feminine beauty and fashionability. Um, we see that in the portrait on the right of Susanna Sith Mead. Um, it's a more modest portrait, but still the artist uh, lavishes great attention to the details of her dress. Um, uh, the sitter also prominently clutches a, um, a, a little bouquet of flowers, a nosegay to her breast. And flowers, particularly pink roses, were used in portraits as a sign of feminine loveliness and beauty. We also see musical instruments as a common attribute in female portraits in colonial Virginia. Um, these uh, attributes in, in a very general way, signal that this woman, this female sitter, has a certain level of genteel accomplishment. Uh, genteel women were expected to be able to read, to recite poetry, to make fine needlework, also to um, uh, 
perform musically, whether through singing or playing an instrument. Um, Lucy Randolph Burwell's portrait on the left, we, we've already seen that. She is um, playing a lute, uh, an instrument that may or may not speak to whether she actually played a lute in real life, but it one that references English portrait tra traditions, such as uh, this famous portrait by Sir Joshua Reynolds. The second portrait um, of Teresa Blount, she's shown sitting at a spinet and holding a um, sheet of music. Uh, now in Teresa's case, she was indeed very musically talented and had a large library collection of musical manuscripts. Um, we can learn even more about her in the somewhat subtle allusions made in, in these attributes. The sheet music, uh, you can read the writing, it's titled Clymene, sung by Mrs. Toft. That's a reference to an opera, Pyrrhus and Demetrius, that was performed in London, and the lead role was sung by Catherine Toffs, the Mrs. Toffs, that's referenced in the inscribed title on um, the sheet music in the portrait. Um, now, this is a very personal reference to Teresa because it alludes to Teresa's friendship with Alexander Pope. Um, Teresa purportedly inspired Pope's Rape of the Lock. Um, and also, uh, it refers a little perhaps to Teresa's own personal life. Like the opera character, she faced the very discouraging prospect of an arranged marriage around the time that this portrait was painted. And actually her friend Alexander Pope wrote about that in a poem that he dedicated to her. Um, fortunately for Teresa, she, she managed to escape that um, fate and she remained unmarried for, for her life. I also wanna look at a couple of common attributes we find in children's portraits, um, like the portraits of their parents, these um, not only signify the status and wealth of the family, but children's portraits also embody the uh, future hopes of the family and their generational and dynastic aspirations. Um, and um, two uh, examples of portraits of children in the VMHC's collection include this image on the right of Man and Elizabeth Page. Um, as you can see, they're both dressed like little adults, which was fairly common for children until um, the later decades of the 18th century, um, when a different conception, a more romanticized conception of childhood was developed. Um, so um, the children are dressed like miniature adults, and they were expected to behave like miniature adults. Um, the uh, boy in this portrait is Man Page. He holds a cardinal, um, which is a symbol of Virginia, so of his, um, his location. Elizabeth um, holds a fashion doll. And as um, Bill mentioned, um, in looking at the portrait of um, another family member, um, th these dolls were used to communicate stylistic trends, um, uh, to model adult fashions, but they were also used as toys. And so the doll that Elizabeth Page holds here, um, it was meant to train her in her future duties as a mother, as someone who would bear and raise children. One of the primary roles for women uh, throughout the colonial period and beyond. Uh, in the portrait at right, which is the last one I'll talk about, um, we see the children of Philip and Mary Grimes, this group portrait of their four children from left to right, Lucy, John, Philip, and Charles. And um, this portrait really communicates a lot about um, the ages of the children through their dress. They're all wearing age appropriate dress. The older children, Lucy and Philip, are, are dressed as adults, as little miniature adults, whereas the younger children, who are both boys, um, wear um, uh, robes, um, a gown in the case of John, who's second from left, and then a, a very loose shift um, worn by the youngest Charles at far right. Um, you'll notice that Lucy um, 
is wearing an apron that's full of cherries, fruit or very frequently symbols of um, female uh, fecundity and nurturing. Um, so a kind of sign of her future role as a mother, um, uh, whereas um, another sign, another attribute that tells us a little bit about these children is um, her brother uh, who has his tricorn hat tucked under his arm. Um, that was a sign of male genteel behavior, kind of similar to the hand tuck we see. And then um, the youngest boy who's playing in a toy wagon that's being pulled by his elder brother. It suggests a certain kind of leadership role that the older brother has uh, among his siblings. So I hope that this um, brief survey of some examples of portraits in the VMHC collection has given you an um, overview of some of the myriad ways in which these Virginia portraits can um, signify uh, uh, aspects of the sitter's identity. With that, I think we're going to turn to audience questions now. Well, thank you all so much for such a great um, set of presentations about um, portraits in colonial Virginia. Um, really, just so much to think about. I think we only have a few minutes, but I want to start on and see, see where we go here. Um, but I want to start with a question for Janine. Um, both Karen and Bill talked about different kinds of uh, features, specific features of these portraits whether it's the kind of iconography of um, the material that the sitters are holding or the backgrounds or the particular artist's kind of work. There's one thing that's really quite important, which is um, that these are all colonial Virginians. Um, so so I, I think it, uh, you know, a question for you is, um, how do we see these portraits as fundamentally about colonial Virginia? What is the colonial context here? Right. Um, well, as Karen and Bill both sort of talked about, um, these subjects were very much thinking about their status in colonial Virginia, but um, I think in a larger sense, they were also very much trying to negotiate what it meant to be a colonial Virginian and also to be an imperial subject. And to be an agent for the British Empire. And so there is some sense of their anxiety and wanting to show off their gentility, but I think there's also a lot of proud moments about the role they could play specifically in Virginia. Um, like with Karen showing, you know, the Virginia Cardinal slash Virginia Nightingale, it was, as it was often called, they're making very specific comments about how they can um, participate in empire and have sort of a certain um, a certain leg up as it is, um, you know, as the phrase may be, um, as subjects in Virginia and being particularly well situated to govern the colonial wilderness. And they were often in conflict with these imperial officials who were trying to assert themselves in the colonies. And so these, these portraits are also about how they themselves are Americans are Creole subjects and therefore have the power um, and should have authority and sovereignty over their own local um, sort of um, decisions they were making. And you see this throughout the entire colonial period, starting with like Lucy Park Bird and insisting on having these very um, indigenous objects in these portraits as a way to assert their Virginianness, but also to fight back against claims about their inferiority or lack of ability to govern themselves. Karen, can you chime in here <laughs> um, on this? Um, sure enough, there's no OI event without me being muted it's at one point or another when I don't wish to be. Anyway, continuing that tradition. Um, <clears throat> Karen, I wondered if you could just chime in on another thing that's really obvious about these portraits, which is that these are obvious, these are elite Virginians. These mm -hmm. are white, almost entirely slave holding people yeah. Um, so can you talk about, because I think um, there, are, there are features of these portraits that are um, an expert can identify, 
but there, are, there is a kind of an overwhelming message of these portraits, which is about power. And it is about the fact that these people are elite and do assert their, um, their right to the labor and control of other people's lives. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And, um, you know, the very assertion of that is um, embodied in the portrait itself, just being able to afford a portrait, uh, to have a home that was large enough and grand enough to accommodate a large painting being hung on the wall. Um, and that wealth in Virginia among the, the planter elites and, and most of these families were involved um, uh, in, in the tobacco trade in some way, shape or form. You know, it was the um, uh, that that wealth, that family wealth, came from enslaved labor, um, indentured labor initially, but um, certainly by the end of the colonial period, predominantly enslaved labor. So um, there's a very literal way in which these um, portraits embody those kinds of power relationships between enslavers and the um, uh, and I think that it. It might be hard for contemporary audiences to appreciate the visual impact of portraits because we live in a world that's just saturated with images and it's so easy to get and to share images of your family and loved ones and friends with each other uh, instantaneously. And in the pre-photographic era and in the you know pre-internet era, that was impossible wasn't possible. So portraits were were really rare and and really um, exclusive commodities for these families to own. And uh, like I say, it, it, we may have lost some of the sense of the wonder and aura that these portraits would have had. But if you, you know, visited a, a Westover or a Wilton or one of these other uh, plantation homes and saw um, uh, these portraits hanging on the wall, you know, you would be, um, you would be, wow, that was the intention of them to really uh, very actively and assertively communicate the family's wealth and status. Yeah, thank you. I was really struck by a point that Janine made before about the fact that these portraits are at Shirley, this kind of long-standing tradition and wouldn't be people just visiting there, but also I thought about this because I mean, Janine taught me this, but all of you have, have um, uh, gestured at this, that it would also be people who were laboring in those households who would view that kind of display of power um, and privilege. Um, so I, there, there are actually a couple of really good questions now in the chat, and I'm sorry that I saw them a little, a little late. Um, but because we're, run, we're already running over, I think I need to simply thank all of you for this really wonderful presentation. Bill, Karen, Janine, thank you so much for sharing this, this with us. Um, and I'll just remind people that they can go to colonialvirginiaportraits.org and see some of these wonderful um, portraits that are at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. And of course, they can visit the VMHC uh, HC, uh, website as well um, to see some really tremendous work. Thank you all so, so much. And thank you all for being with us. Thank you. Have a great evening. <laughs>